Hello beautiful people, welcome to my channel. I am Daisy, your hostess. In this video we will continue on with the book titled The Man Who Knew by Ralph Waldo Trine. All I can tell you is that the author is showing us the character of the man who knew, the strength and the courage and his conviction. And much of that has been revealed in the last two chapters that we just finished covering. So if you're new to the channel and you found us at this video, please do make sure to visit the playlist and grab those previous chapters, especially those last two. They really, really took it home as far as the character of this man. So without further delay, I will turn the page to chapter 17, Other Helpers of the Way Shower. That the love and the wisdom of God were manifested in and through the way shower to an unusual degree is evident. The power of God worked through him, or rather by his living completely in the realization of the essential oneness of his life with the God life and opening himself trustingly to the inner wisdom. The laws through which God works were so revealed to him that he became the instrument of the power. Frankly, he said it was this creative spirit of life that he called the Father, and affirmed that of himself he could do nothing, but only as he realized the oneness of his life with the Father's life, and lived fully in that realization. The Father, he says, never leaves him alone or in the dark or in need, for he seeks always to know and to do the will of the Father. It was always, though, my Father and your Father. And herein lies the value of his revelation, his teaching, his life to us men on earth. Eagerly, passionately, almost desperately, we might say, he endeavors to make this known. Frankly, he states the secret of his own life. It is not I, but the Father within who doeth his work. Although he glories to be the teacher, the way shower, Frankly and humbly, he says, Call me not good, for there is only one good, and that is God. Although speaking always with authority, the authority of a teacher, he never exalted himself. Again and again he stated that he that exalted himself as himself, in distinction from the power working with him, should be abased. It was his experience of God firsthand that makes him the real and great teacher, that makes him speak with authority. So impressed were his hearers with the manner of his speech in this, that they often remarked concerning it. His words carried a freshness and a conviction that many times made them stand in awe, and that made many follow him eagerly. His manner was different from that of their teachers of religion. There was never any harking back to the authority of someone or something in the past. And as to the priests of the temple, now primarily their overlords, instead of ministers of religion, never a mention except to flay and castigate them as dogmatists and self-seekers, the very opposite of what he came to portray. They took the law, the wall of the law, they took the truth of the prophets, free and independent men who opened themselves to the voice of their God and built it into a system with innumerable hedges and observances. They said, You must believe and observe these things we tell you, or you have no religion or the benefits of religion. You must support and reverence the institution. In this way they raised the dead hand between a man and his God. They fed with stones instead of bread and demanded recognition and reverence and a price for doing it. It was the very opposite of the teachings of the Master, and we can readily see why his righteous indignation at times flared forth. Then, Jesus of Galilee, the world has perhaps known no greater enemy, ancient or modern, of religious dogmatism. Not that he opposed religious institutions, only that type which receives its system of dogma from dead hands of the past, and which would weave it into crowns to be pressed on other men's brows. It was Emerson, he of clear-seeing mind and free and independent spirit, who said, quote, If a man claims to know and speak of God, and carries you backward to the phraseology of some old moldered nation in another country, in another world, 
believe him not. End quote. And again he said, quote, Yourself, a newborn bard of the Holy Ghost, cast behind you all conformity and acquaint man at first hand with deity. Nothing is at last sacred but the integrity of your own mind. God is one and omnipresent. Here or nowhere is the whole fact. End quote. Emerson's wide understanding is also shown by his saying, As there is no screen or ceiling between our heads and the infinite heavens, so is there no bar or wall in the soul where man ceases and God begins. Ineffable is the union of man and God in the every act of the soul. And we all know, O oh friend, never strike sail to a fear, come into port greatly, or sail with God the seas. Another whose intuitive sense was more than common, independent of spirit and always open, caught the message of the Master. It was Channing who said, quote, One sublime idea has taken stronghold of my mind. It is the greatness of the soul, its divinity, its union with God. The greatness of the soul is especially seen in freedom of will and moral power. I can but pity the man who recognizes nothing godlike in his own nature. The soul viewed in this light should fill us with awe. It is an immortal germ which contains now within itself what endless ages are to unfold. It is truly an image of the infinity of God. End quote. He was a magnificent character, a magnificent influence in American and in English-speaking life. As we have just seen, he believed supremely in God. He knew God. He believed in the divinity of Jesus, that the Christ became enthroned and dwelt in him. But in his day, he was called a Unitarian. He did not believe in the virgin birth. He did not believe that Jesus did not have a father, but he knew history, ancient history, when it was linked with mythology, and he knew that a similar belief was quite common, and that about the nebulous time dogma became to take form, there were scores of men, well-known men, who had to be accounted for in some unusual way, who had no father. Their mothers conceived and bore them through contact with, or impulse from, some mythological character, or angel, or spirit, or god. Various theories were held as to the method of contact, one of the most popular for quite a while at least, was that it was through the ear. Channing knew that this was held to be true of many of the Roman emperors, of whom Augustus was a conspicuous example. They demanded such recognition and belief. He knew that there were many thousand early Christians who, because they would not publicly subscribe to it, and so perjure their minds and souls, were hounded, were driven to the catacombs, were tortured, and were put to death by those in power. He knew that Nero and others in the imperial line demanded this belief, and were ruthless in their extermination of numberless early Christians, infidels in their regard, who would not profess it, enemies of the existing religion, enemies of the state. Martyrs they were, almost unbelievable in their faith and their courage. They were free minds in the sense Channing intended when he wrote, quote, I call that mind free, which protects itself against the usurpations of society, does not cower to human opinion, and feels itself accountable to a higher tribunal than man's. I call that mind free, which sets no bounds to its love, recognizes in all human beings the image of God, and offers itself up a willing victim to the cause of mankind. I call that mind free which, conscious of its affinity with God, passes the bounds of time and death, and finds inexhaustible power in immortality. End quote. We men and women of today should be grateful, far more grateful than we are, for the freedom, the intellectual freedom, the moral and spiritual freedom that we have. Contrast our condition with that of these early disciples and followers of the Master. 
the way they were persecuted and massacred for daring to think their own thoughts and to follow and be true to their own beliefs. And then later, when another type of church was formed, and it grew powerful and passed into the hands of political and ecclesiastical traders for power and authority and revenue, when it was buttressed in its system of dogma which the free minds and spirits of vast numbers would not subscribe to, how they were hounded and persecuted and murdered by the thousands, by the tens of thousands. Times and places where no man could call his mind or his soul his own, where no free mind could think and speak his thoughts without risk of seeing the pots of boiling oil, the burning pyre, or the dungeon from which perhaps he would never again emerge alive. When killings ceased, persecutions continued. There was a time, we forgot that there was, when the Bible was a closed book, concealed and kept from the people, and only such fragments let out as suited the purposes of the organization. And then the great epoch came, the uprising, the reformation when brave and courageous men seized and translated and gave it to the people. And now no man so poor but can own it and read it and interpret it for himself. The people struggled along as best they could with their downtrodden, unlit lives. Beyond knowing that there was such a person, they knew nothing of the life, the truth, the purpose of Jesus of Galilee. They knew nothing of his realization, his own teachings, his real message. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They did not know that he had lost his life by arousing the enmity of ecclesiastical leaders of the sordid type that now again prevailed. His truth, his gospel, his good news that thrilled him and that he was inspired to give to all who would hear had been thrust aside, sidetracked. A system embracing matters of opinion about him had been switched in its place onto the main track and the people were told that his life and his death were for a different purpose. This better served the purpose of the dogmatist, the purpose of a close organization. Dogma has no affiliation with truth. It must be built upon something else. The result was that the vital life-giving, life-saving religion of the master became changed into a fear-ridden, parasitic religion about him. The forward-looking, divinely inspired, and divinely inspiring truth of the prophet of Galilee fell into the hands of the uninspired priest who endeavored to relate it to a system and built a system upon it. So it started looking backward. With the eclipse of his truth came the greatest loss that the life of the world has ever known. Will his truth, his gospel, his good news? It is all so simple, he said, if you will take it as I give it to you, come again? Will it come with a power to dominate the lives of enough individuals that through them it may yet redeem a stricken world? Has the way shower been biding his time? Is his projected second coming, the spirit of his truth, an even greater power near in the life of a troubled world? If in Christendom the great body of believers or semi-believers in things about him can, by the transforming of their minds and spirits, be transformed into divinely inspired, virile disciples of the Master through an understanding and a following of his teachings so simple as he gave them, yet so certain in the results that it can be. In this way, as he so longed, he may yet become the light of the world. End of chapter 17. We're going to stay here in this video and I'll go ahead and move on to the next chapter. Stay comfy or go get your coffee, go get your tea, go get your wine, whatever it is that you love to indulge. Hit that like button and head back over here as I now am going to flip the page to chapter 18. Look up and drop that load. There are three things that the master stood for and exemplified to a superlative degree and that make him of such great value to men of today. He was the in-knower, the man of courage, the man of love. 
His unusual sense or faculty of immediate awareness resulted in his wonderful aptitude for understanding life and discerning the things of the mind and the spirit as attributes of life. He knew life as spirit, and spirit as the God stuff of life. He knew man as spirit, and spirit therefore as the God stuff of man. Unalterably, he identified the two. God outflowing and manifesting himself in the life of man, and in the fullest sense the life of all in existence. Man receiving, consciously receiving, and in turn manifesting the life of God. Hence Jesus' realization for himself, I and my Father are one. Hence his understanding and his specific assertion, As I am, so you shall be. And it could not be otherwise, for when he perceived and taught that God is spirit, the universal spirit manifesting itself as life, then there is but the one life flowing out and becoming the energizing force in all things to whose existence it gives form and substance. For individual man consciously to realize this enables him to become an intelligent and a mastering expression of the one universal life. There is no sense of separation. There is no separation. There is at one minute. Man one with his maker, realizing and living in that true and high state. This at one moment becomes effective in the life of each individual man who receives, who believes, and who lives this truth of the Master, the truth he gave the full and eager plenitude of his life to reveal, to teach, and eventually to die for. To each individual man, In this way, he becomes a savior, and as he so expressly, so eagerly, and so continually taught, he cannot become a savior, any man's savior, in any other way. To connect with any scheme of salvation based upon anything different from this, his truth, is to do violence to his truth, and to deny his truth is to deny him. Through this, his truth, he becomes the mediator the mediator uniting man with his God. This is in truth the atonement that becomes real and effective in its results. For one to get clearly his message, to realize clearly his truth, that one's life is from and in this one universal life, and that one may so order and so live one's life, gives one the more abundant life, which the way shower meant when he said, I am come that you might have life, and that you might have it more abundantly. It was this truth of life which his in-knowing sense, his cosmic sense perceived, which he realized and lived and demonstrated, and then made it his life mission to reveal to others, and his persistent courage and self-giving love in doing this make him indeed the great liberator of the human mind and spirit and life. Many who heard him directly were so impressed by the genuineness and the power of his personality, and through this, the genuineness and the power of his truth that they believed. And his asserted transformation in their lives almost immediately took meaning and form. One who was his ardent follower and advocate said, As many as believed on him, to them gave he the power to become sons of God. Truth is reasonable, truth is universal, law is universal, hence immutable. We men of today are potential possessors of a far more abundant life than in our hurry, carrying our little loads that become big loads, we realize. In our ignorance, our rush, our fear, and our worry, we inhibit that power working in and through us would do the thing far better than the little self can ever do it, and enable us to live a life far more carefree. Hear me, he said. Hear my word. I would become your friend, your savior. I would save you from that sense of separateness, that sense of aloneness which so enfeebles you. I would lift that load of care which so tires and wearies you. It is not right to go through life with such a pack. Life is for joy, 
and will be joyful when it is lived aright. I would help you. I long to help you. If you will hear my word, my gospel, my good news. If you will hear and live my truth and so let me help you, your darkened, uncertain, halting way will become a God-illumined way. Reach out and grasp the unseen hand waiting in love to lead you. But you must take it. Look up. You are not alone. As you look up, you will then straighten up. And your pack will fall away. You have thought it a part of you, a hunch on your back. God is love waiting for your reception and allegiance. This larger way is the real way of life. Believe me, it is true. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My yoke is but the link linking your life with the Father's life. My yoke is not a burden. It is the means of lightening your burden. Life should be joyous and light, not heavy and gloomy and fear-laden. Otherwise, it is a delusion. But believe me, life is not a delusion. The delusion is that in trying to live our own little lives alone through perversity or ignorance, we cut ourselves off from the larger universal life. We shut out the light. We inhibit the very power that would work in and through us for our greatest good. My Father does not leave me alone or in the dark or in need because I seek always to know and to do the will of my Father. And so you will find it will be in your life if you will do the same. For He is my Father and your Father. This is that larger and more abundant life which I have found and which I would have you know. End of chapter 18. All right, my dear one, hit that like button and let's head over to the next video where we're going to discover love, the law of life.